and ask the question verbally. Before Yen starts, let me thank him on everyone's behalf. Today's session is about how to learn, and Yen is a learning machine himself. He was first a consultant at Bain, then he went to Harvard for his MBA and became an investor afterwards. He is the founder of their asset manager, Harat Global, and he was a professor at Columbia for many years. While he was at Columbia, he was known as the most the pickiest professor because while we have 700 MBA students every year, every year he only picks seven students to teach. So even if you went through all the hustles to get into Columbia, you only have 1% chance to become his student. Today, because of Yen's kindness of not being so picky, we all enjoyed this 1% learning opportunities. Without further delay, Yen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, KY. All right. Um, if we could mute, so that would be great. Yep. Uh, all right. Can we stop share for one second so I can um, see everybody? All right. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm transmitting to you guys from Rye in Westchester, New York. For those of you in, in various parts of the world, I want you to know that New York is strong, safe, and recovering from this crisis. Uh, who would have ever thought that this uh, crisis would give us an opportunity to connect globally to each of you from, from our home to yours? I hope this message finds you safe and well. I wanna welcome the class of 2020, 21, and 22. Um, and for each of our friends across this world, we're also being joined by many people who are fighting this crisis from the front line. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you as part of this conversation. There are some educators here. Uh, and thank you, and I apologize in advance if I'm using some incorrect terms, but this is a conversation of sharing our thoughts and our best practices with, with each of you. I wanted to also start with this, and this is very unusual times, clearly. And the topic today is on mastery and learning how to learn. And the message that I want to send to each and all of you is that is the only constant that is going to allow us to deal with crises and evolve in the world that we are inheriting after this moment. This is by far the most important thing that you will ever learn in whether it's in a school or in your professions. And today we hope to share some of those insights with you. So let me jump in and share uh, a slide deck. Okay. okay. So hopefully you can see the screen, wonderful. So this is effectively the period that a lot, a lot of you are coming into this crisis and, and feel very disoriented by the markets and the, the upheaval that we're facing in the real economy. I wanted to share with you, first of all, that when I started my career, it was in 2001 when I graduated from Harvard Business School. It was, I literally started my professional investing career on September 17th of 2001. That was the day the markets reopened after 9-11. And it was the aftermath of the dot-com bubble. So when I was at HBS, it was on the euphoric rise and then the collapse of that summer. The point that I wanna to make to you on this is the sun will rise again and there's always opportunities for the prepared and, the, and people who have the fortitude to find opportunity. It will be uncertain times, but you will get through this. So the topic for today is mastery and learning how to learn. Again, in uncertain times, and especially into the economy that you all will be living and investing in, the only skill that really matters is your ability to adapt and learn. This is, I'm gonna split this conversation into meta-learning concepts and subject matter learning concepts. So learning how to learn broadly and then how to apply it to specific subjects. We'll do this in about 45 minutes of content and then followed with 45 minutes of Q&A. So this is taught through the lens of investing and what makes a great investor. The first is it takes a great mind or IQ with great taste. The second is great temperament or an emotional quotient. And then finally, a huge work ethic. There is no shortcut in success. One of the parts that I want to touch with you is that investing is one of the great puzzles of this world. It's one of the great challenges and puzzles that we have to deal with. It's a huge responsibility and a privilege to manage other people's money and your own. Part of what I want to transmit in this conversation is a mindset and a toolkit 
to deal with all of the setbacks and challenges that dealing with investing and broadly uncertainty at large will present you. I want to equip you with a mindset where you feel sorry for the wall. You're going to be faced with tremendous setbacks and uncertainty and throughout your career. What I hope you take from this is a mindset that lets you navigate some of it. So firstly, to be a skillful investor, there is a lifetime of skills you need to acquire. You have to learn in dog years in order to compete at a high level early in your career. If you do not train and refine your learning style, you can't see great investments if they were literally in front of your face. You don't have a lifetime to learn these skills and be proficient in order to perform. So in order to, to be part of this industry, you need to learn and learn at an extraordinarily fast rate. So to begin, we'll focus on meta learning concepts. I'm gonna call on the class of 2035. If, uh, if Charles and Julia are there, I would love you to please join me and uh, help me explain, first of all, who this is and what movie this is from. Hey Charles. Oh, hey. Um. So the question was, could you repeat the question? Who, who is this gentleman on the top here? Oh, that's the guy from Kung Fu Panda. Do you know what his name is? No. His name is Poe. Do you know what Poe's doing? Yeah, he's trying to find the dragon scroll, but then he realizes that it's empty. And, and, and what, what, is, what was the point of the dragon scroll? Is that it's just a reflection of himself. So he realizes that he can do it and there's really nothing else. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Charles. So the point here, and I'm going to teach you through the lens of many greats, and this is one of the great ones, is the point here is there is no shortcut and you have to own it. So the first point I wanted to share with you in the first concept is the concept of you, Inc. As investors, and I would argue all, in, all professionals, you are an intellectual property-based asset. You have to think of yourself as the CEO of you, Inc. And that incorporates all elements of what that means. You have to be able to invest in that core intellectual property. You have to own it. And everything you do must control how fast and how effective you control that IP. To play this game, you have to become a highly functional committed learning machine. The two gentlemen on the left will be presenting this afternoon in their AGM, and I'm sure many of you will be tuning in for it. And on the right there is Lee Kuan Yew, one of my heroes. Lee Kuan Yew was one of the smartest leaders in the world. And the key point from him was leadership and learning are inextricably linked. I'm gonna introduce you to two new people. Um, by the way, if anybody can queue in here on, if anyone knows who the person on the left or the person on the right here, I just wanna start queuing people up into the chat room. Huge bonus for anybody on the left. Well, the word I want to introduce you to is Aya. It's a Polynesian word for personal sovereignty. The point is you must own your journey. You are accountable for the entire ride. The lady's name is Elizabeth Lindsay. She's a Polynesian anthropologist. The person here on the right, Nelson Mandela. The key point here is you, you've been extremely lucky. Most of you on this screen have won the ovarian lottery. You're in a privileged position where you've got parents that have loved you and love you unconditionally. You've been given an education that you will never be able, uh, that, 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 is, that is priceless. Um, the point here is you must not hand your career or your life to anyone lightly. You have to retain sovereign rule over your learning curve and be fully accountable for it. In five, 10, and 15, and 30 years, you will completely understand the power of this decision. Some of you will be lucky to go to great firms. Many of you will not. The point is it shouldn't matter. You must own it for yourself. I'm not sure where someone is, uh, is being able to subscribe on top of our, uh, uh, our slides here. I don't know if KY, if you can override that. Um, this is your life in one slide. Please, the, the point here is you may feel like this isolation is going on forever, but this is very finite. And so this is your entire life in one slide. 
The point is you don't have a lot of time to waste. This is your entire life in months in one page. The point that I'm trying to make also to you is your sweet spot where you are highly proficient in a position to be highly accountable is very finite. Investing done right can last very long and deep into your career, done wrong, and you will burn out very fast. So the point here is get on with it and get on with it quickly. Before we get into the technical accelerators of learning, I wanna change your relationship with discomfort and pain. The first point here is that everything that you seek or want from your life is just outside of your comfort zone. Otherwise, you are likely to already have it. This aphorism is from Bruce Lee. Do not pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. Ubuntu is another Polynesian word I wanted to share with you. If you find your why, you will always find your how. Ubuntu is your reason for being. The bigger the why, the more powerful the how. If there is no consequence to your why, you will not have good solutions. If your why is extraordinarily large, you will be more creative than, will, than, than any problem can overwhelm. This, in the rewiring of your relationship with pain, what I'm hoping to also pass to you here is the concept of struggle. This will be your companion in for your entire life if your journey is based on excellence. The easy decisions will always be passed to others. To excel, challenges will increase. So the quote here is from Billie Jean King, a very famous tennis player, that pressure is a privilege and it only comes to those who earn it. As you ascent into higher levels of responsibility, the easy decisions should be handed to others. And henceforth, the struggle will only increase as you become more privileged in the decisions you are empowered to make. It becomes a lot more fun when you understand that struggle is your journey, your partner in this journey, and you don't want to be fighting it. The difference between struggle and suffering is context. Specifically, struggling with meaning is, is just pain with meaning. Suffering is pain without meaning. So being able to understand the context of your pain is extremely important. It can become motivating or destroying. Struggling is actually the neurological precursor to insight. If you are struggling, it means you are learning and you are growing. Don't fight it. You have to learn to embrace it. The aha moment is literally your brain struggling to a point where it's preparing itself to rewire with insight. I'm going to cold call some people in here, or please, if, if anyone can chime in, I can't see everyone, so uh, hopefully, KY, you can help me in here. But I'm going to ask someone to please help me uh, identify what this movie was and what is going on here. Before I get to that person, if you could show your hands uh, or, or go onto the chat room, that would be great. Before you go and, and we explore into all the problem solving elements of this, the most important question I implore you to ask is choose your game. What I mean by that is you're about to pour 60% of your life's productive life force into a career, but the key question is where should you spend your time? Spend real time and resources working out this question. Most people follow a path because it creates momentum and it's too difficult for them to change path. The point is try to pick unfair fights, games that are valuable and that you can win. Mahir, Thank you for, for jumping onto the, the, the chat room. Can you please share with us uh, what movie this is from? Uh, unmute if you wouldn't mind, and, and please tell everywhere where you're calling from. Sure. Uh, my name is Mihir. I'm calling in from Singapore. Uh, this is an Indiana Jones movie, and uh, I'm confused about whether this is The Last Crusade, but I think I'm going to go with The Last Crusade. Um, and there's this sort of marketplace scene where I think the guy who's on the floor um, pulls out a big knife, and Indy just shoots him, and I think the... The, the, the line of the scene is him saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Absolutely. And so the whole point here is try to pick unfair fights. These are games that are valuable and that you can win. And that's the key to it. So the, 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 the point that I'm making again is before you start pouring your entire life force in terms of mastering an art, actually have this, the ability to sample enough in your career to know that's what you want to spend your life in. This is the most important chart in the entire deck. 
there are two concepts in here that explain everything in mastery. The first on the left side is the compound math chart, and the second is the mastery step function chart. Compound math is by far the most important force in the universe, and you have to get on the right side of it as early as you possibly can. And this applies to literally everything in your life, whether it's capital, ability, insights, contacts. The setup of this curve on the left side is on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is ability, capital, contacts, whatever is the function that needs to be, to be compounded. Most times in capital markets, we're compounding capital. It's wisdom, insights, frameworks, all of the things in here. This is the most important part of the entire part of your curve and your learning curve. So the point, there are many in this chart. The first is the gradient starts and it's almost difficult to see it on the left side of this curve because it's like you're learning and you're, you're, the amounts that you're compounding off are still small, but over time it becomes incredibly steep. And the point is here at year five, year 10, year 15, or year 30 in your reunions, the marked difference between those who controlled their curves and those that didn't becomes exponentially, literally, more pronounced. So I implore you, and learning is the, is the topic of today, it applies as much to capital, it applies as much to, to contact. If you can control your eye, eye is the gradient of that curve, and N is how long you stay on that curve, you will be extraordinarily successful in your life. But you must control your I, and you have to lengthen your N. There is no exception to this rule. I'm gonna call, call some others on the right side here, so please, uh, or, or one call, uh, chime in here uh, through the, the chat room if you wouldn't mind. I can't see all the 380 people that are on this call at this point. Um, this is the mastery step function chart. The x-axis here is time. The y-axis here is ability. I want to ask, and please jump on if anyone wants to come on here, where does mastery live in this chart? Clifford, I'm going to cold call you in one minute if I don't see someone on there. So Brendan Burns, can you please chime in and, and, uh, and answer here? Yeah, I just said it probably isn't anywhere on the chart because uh, you never attain mastery. Fantastic. And where are you calling in from, Brendan? Uh, from right outside of Philadelphia. Thank you very much. So the point is here, there are diff many different answers to that question, and I love yours, Brendan. The, the, the key insight I wanted to share with you here is, so these are step function increases in ability. These are controlled and uncontrolled leaps, I call them. The uncontrolled leaps is where you have aha moments. Your brain has a piece of insight that solves complex problems that you are literally rewiring your brain. You are different once you've solved that equation or you have that insight than you were before. However, those insights, those abilities start fading over time. In golfing analogies, it's very easy to go from 120 to 110 to 100, but as you go down towards 70 or par, the, the increments become smaller and smaller and the plateaus become longer and longer. The point is the masters actually live on the plateaus. You never get, as Brendan said, to the end point. Mastery and the whole pursuit of mastery is the journey. There is no end point. The point is the masters don't get bored they recognize the plateaus is part of the journey. The other key insight here is masters learn to control their leaps. An uncontrolled leap is what I said before, it's where the amalgam of your experiences create this burst through of insight and it literally rewires your brain. The controlled leaps is where you create environments that create that leap in capability. So many of you are coming to business school or various other institutions to compress their learning and increase those controlled leaps. That's literally what they're doing. For those of you who are leaving business school or others and about to enter the workforce, this is something you must control. This is the determinant, effectively the mastery step function curve is tiny subparts of this exponential curve. You must control this curve. And the more time you invest time and money to control this step function chart, 
will determine the quality of your outcomes and the quality of your life. So let me dive now into some more constructive parts of this. This is Tim Ferriss. And the first part of all problem solving is deconstruction. It starts with knowing your goal and then breaking down the skill and then training it very rigorously. Tim is the master of deconstruction. He will get anybody on any skill to the 10th percentile of performance, top decile performance radically because he's a master of deconstruction. I would recommend you study his materials and his books to understand how he does it. Tiger Woods, by the way, for full disclosure, I am not a golfer, um, but this is how Tiger deconstructs probabilities, putting and the game of golf. So for those of you who are golfers in the room, the natural swing motion for a right-hander is right to left. This is a, 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 a green and, and Tiger segments it into six wedges. The first is the highest probability is right to left. The second is uphill versus downhill. The reason for uphill versus downhill is you can putt firmer uphill than you can downhill. So you go against the gradient of the grass and you can putt straighter when it's uphill. Henceforth, probabilistically, the most, um, uh, the, the optimal spot in a green is to land in, in segment one. Tiger literally reverse engineers every single hole. He starts from the green, back to the T. The point here is every master I have ever studied, there is a game within the game and they deconstruct the core elements of the game to give them advantage. And then they mold the game to their strengths. The next part of this is deliberate practice. So if you, it starts with a cogent mental model of perfect execution. If you don't know what to practice, you can't become great at it. And no amount of effort will solve this. So to become good at anything, you need to know what really good looks and feels like. I call this the Tai Chi swing. Break down the components into its technical components. And if you can do it very, very slowly, then you really understand it. The point is also there, a lot of times speed hides poor technique. The second step then is you need to practice a lot. And this means pushing it to the absolute edge of your abilities. It's hard, but it's really fun. Deep practice is built on this paradox of struggle. If you need to embrace that struggling in a certain targeted way is operating at the edge of your ability, it makes you smarter. All growth comes at the point of resistance. This is both physical and mental. If it's not hard, you already know how to do it. Henceforth, you will not become stronger. You will not become wiser. There is an optimal gap that you know that we'll walk you through in a minute. That is the sweet spot where learning takes off. It's called flow state. I'll explain what that is in a minute. And the last step of this is a feedback loop. You can't refine your skill set without a feedback loop. And it's not about hitting a thousand balls each day. It's about going out there and hitting a hundred absolutely perfectly. And there needs to be an evaluative process that lets you do this. So this is not about speed. This is about purposefulness in the fastest path to mastery. I'm going to share with you a bunch of books. This is one of my heroes. And if you want to study deep technique, this is John Wooden. He was the most successful coach in NCAA basketball history. His teams at UCLA won, uh, won 10 seasons and uh, had a record number of, his win rate is extraordinary. The point is in this, there's dozens of books, I've read them all, this is the best one, Wooden on Leadership, strongly recommend it. The next part on feedback loops is mistakes. Mistakes is another partner on this journey to excellence. All the greats have stumbled and you can't get there without making lots of mistakes. Quite candidly, for those of you, again, at the start of your career, the way you should segment your career path is early on, if you're not making lots of mistakes while you're being watched over and risk managed by others, you're not doing your job because you haven't made the mistakes to learn from by the time you've become a senior leader. You're too fragile and you're too early on this. So Munger, who's about to speak this afternoon, will tell you it's like if you really want to, to sharpen your cognition, you need to learn from your mistakes. Josh Weidskin, whose book, The Art of Learning, I would also recommend, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, is in the long run, your painful, most painful losses prove to be far more valuable than your wins. 
Our greatest insights by far have come from mistakes, not victories. There is one wrinkle in here, which is emotional versus intellectual learning. And I call that the Gandalf moment, which if, if, if mistakes for you only appear at an intellectual layer, you won't actually, um, you won't actually learn them. It needs to go one layer deeper. Your emotions are far, far more important. So as a quick show of hands, and I think there is a symbol here that you can show, are there perfectionists in this room? A few honest people. Carol Dweck's book here on mindset is an essential book for all of you. By the way, I think there's a bunch of you who either don't know how to show the symbol, but it's like there are far more perfectionists in this room today than are, than are, than are showing up with their hands. All of us will seek perfection, but a perfectionist mindset in an investing environment where we're dealing with the future and we're wrong almost half the time, you're gonna have a real struggle. And so it's an essential book. I think this is a masterful piece of work by Carol Dweck. Um, mindset is the book. So moving forward to your operating system. We all learn differently. And this please for the teachers in the room, uh, I apologize in advance for the oversimplification in this. Teaching traditionally in its, in its current form is an analog broadcast model. It is a one to many form of teaching. Learning is hyper-personalized. And so in upgrading your OS, the first part of this is learning how you learn. Know yourself, work yourself out. This is effectively the user's guide to you. How people teach doesn't mean how you need to learn. So each of us all have three learning modalities. Neurolinguistic programming is the broad concept here. The three learning modalities is visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. The vast majority of visual, we all have primary and secondary ways of processing. You break it down into how do you like to receive information? Oops, whoever put that there can please remove it, please. Um, um, it's however you input is um, how do you receive information? How do you like to process it? And then how do you like to make decisions? So to give you a sense of how I do it, I'm a very visual person, which over 85% of people are. I like to, the brain actually works in pictures, not in linear words. I like to condense information into pictorial form. How I process is I type, I need to get very active and translate what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking into word form and pictures. And then I need to talk it through with my team. That's the way I process and output and actually own the parts that have come to me. It needs to be very active and not at all passive forms of processing. Two books for you here. One is Peter Drucker, Managing Oneself. It came in the Harvard Business Review, 1999. It's a very short article, absolutely essential reading to dissect how you learn. The second one is there are at least half of the people in this room are introverts. There are probably people in this room who don't even understand they're introverts. Uh, Susan Cain's book, Quiet, this is an essential part in understanding how to marshal and use your energy in order to learn and pursue this life of excellence. Let me pause there very quickly and see if there are any questions on this first half of the presentation. If you could queue it up into the chat room before I go into subject matter learning. I think uh, Dixon has a very good question. Maybe Dixon, you can unmute yourself. Please, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, KY. Um, hi, and um, my question is, investing um, has very slow feedback loops and it, the, most of the feedback could provide false signals. So how do you improve your investing skills via deliberate practice? Thank you. A uh, wonderful question, Dixon. Thank you for, thank you for your question. Um, if you wouldn't mind clicking your, your camera on so we can see you, but the, um, the simple answer to this, um, in investing, there are short dated, uh, and sorry, there's a couple of nuances to what you asked. One is signal to noise, and be very careful on the signals that you use to, tra to train your feedback loops. So uh, if, you're in if you're investing based on a thesis versus on a price, you wanna be checking if your thesis is tracking versus the price action, that's step one. The second is uh, actually public market investing is very fast cycle uh, feedback compared to private equity or other forms of investing. Uh, we get signals constantly, if not every quarter. The next one is you want to learn in clusters. You don't want to learn on individual signals. Individual signals are prone to tremendous amounts of noise. You want to look for clusters of patterns in the way that you're evolving your insights. 
The last part is we like to learn within frameworks. Not all decisions and not all styles of investing are the same. And the last part is break it down into constituent parts. So you're looking for consistent patterns within elements of your investment process, elements of your thinking. Not, it's not just one decision. There's lots of sub parts of it and I'll come to that in a minute. Thank you for your question, Dixon. KY, was there any others? Yep, Jean has another. Maybe Jean, you can unmute yourself. Jean Philippines. Oh yes, Jan, sorry. Uh, it's Chip here. Thank you for uh, doing that. Very, very insightful and very good. Um, I was just wondering if you have some example of deconstruction in either research process on, or in your investment process that would be appreciated. Wonderful. Uh, lovely to hear from you, JP. Um, and I'll start this and, and there's plenty more of it actually in the second half of this. So in deconstructing, investing, um, it's, it's effectively like saying tennis. Go play tennis. Tennis is a game of, made up of lots of games, right? And so deconstruction for us in investing, for example, primary research is a component of our primary research, sorry, of our research process. Modeling is another part of our process. Risk is another part of our process. And all of these come together in order to create our research process. So in decoupling it, and this is an element of how you train also, Primary research is an example of that. What that means for us is going and talk to primary sources. You break that down another layer. Primary sources is how do you identify people of knowledge who can help you deepen your understanding of an investment situation? You break that down again. How do you, so how do you contact them and find their details? Break it down again. How do you engage them to talk to you? Break it down one more step. How do you break down the way that you ask questions, sequence questions, engage a contact, so that they can, they can exchange in with you uh, valuable insights that inform your judgment. The point is to keep breaking down all parts of your investment process and keep double clicking down, and that's what lets you refine it. So just to build on that, we spent a whole year doing nothing but primary research processes. We spent months on, question, on creating and crafting proper emails that would engage uh, primary sources. How do you identify them? Where do you even sit in a room if you're in a group meeting? These are the ways that if you want to be skillful in the way and you want to create excellence, excellence requires very specific granular levels of detail executed extremely well. Uh, hopefully that helps JP and I'm going to I'll dive forward uh, to expand a little bit more on that. Um, thank you for your question. There'll be plenty more time after this. So next part here is subject matter learning concepts. This is now how do we apply some learning into a more finite process? It starts with the power of questions. Um, if everyone could mute, it would be great, please. Um, it starts with the power of questions. All problem solving comes down to the quality of your question. And I would argue we can gauge intelligence far more from the quality of the question than the quality of the answer. It comes with the quality of the question and the structure of the problem. The better the question, the stronger the answer. It starts with, and Einstein, there's a quote up here for you later, but it's like, if you think deeply about the question, you will find the answer. Your brain is an incredibly sophisticated problem solving device, but it lacks orientation and that's what questions do. So it starts here on the right side, which is the Pareto principle of an 80-20, where 80% of the effect actually comes from 20% of the action. Can you work it out? And the, the irony is mastery, once you've got that 80, focuses on the remaining 20 and takes it all the way so there's a transfer in here but to even work out what that 20 of effort is to get to the 80 requires deep thought right up front in your process the second step here on the bottom left corner is how we do it for investing the left side here is important and not important the right the the the, uh, the x-axis here is knowable and, un and and not knowable we are dealing with a probabilistic future business we deal with a constantly dynamic world we have to focus on the important and the knowable. What is not knowable and not important? Irrelevant. What is not knowable and knowable? Sorry, not important and knowable? It's just busy work. And then the really hard part of this is it really important and not knowable. And that requires inference and deduction. The litmus test for this is, is there a so what? If there is no so what, move on. And what we mean by that is, even if you had the answer in any direction, does it change the outcome? But the power of questions 
is absolutely essential. And I believe this is also one of the reasons why I would strongly encourage all of you to study philosophy of some form. It is the art of asking awesome questions. The next is to, to, to handle incredibly complex problems and learn really deeply. You need your entire mind. And that means your subconscious mind. Your conscious mind is a very small part of the power of your brain. And how do we do it? There are many techniques in here. And again, I would highly recommend you read The Art of Learning. It's a wonderful book uh, on this uh, that Josh Weizkin wrote. He's the, the guy from In Search of Bobby Fischer. Um, we use journaling a lot. Again, it's really important to use great questions. Meditation, the power of white space. So this is part of the reason when you go through all of this effort in filling your head, studying so deeply and you can't crack a problem, don't underestimate how powerful white space is. And why? Because the way that the brain distills, it needs to quieten and it needs to connect dots. And if your conscious mind is trying to do all the work, the subconscious can't. The subconscious works when you quieten your mind. Meditation is a really important part of this. And I'm sure you've also, there is a pattern to the aha moment. People think that exercise is an optional part of this. In order to be a peak performer, your body needs to be fueled in an incredible way. The journey for excellence is exhausting, right? You need a huge amount of exercise because you need a big tank. It also obviously makes you more resilient to stress, but it also creates white space that lets your mind and your body absorb all this crazy information that you filled it with. The power of white space, there's many of my best insights have come from being in the water, being on the holiday with my, my, my family, going on a walk, going on a run, in the middle of a workout. Why? Because my brain is being quiet enough to distill it, but the art of questions lets it focus on a key factor. So to bring this alive for you, um, and, and don't underestimate, by the way, your, your subconscious mind is where all the creative elements of it are. The way we do this is how do you find there are certain zones in your day where your conscious mind is not fully fired up yet and you can use the power of your unconscious mind. The way that I've found it most powerful is you need to focus overnight on one, two, maximum three questions. Commit them into some journal, literally write them down for the last half hour before you go to bed. When you get up, before you check your email, before you flood yourself with all of the useless stuff that comes in in the morning, journal like crazy on what the answer to those questions are. Don't question it, just go. Go for half an hour, go for as long as you can. It doesn't even matter. Get in the practice of this. Try it for five days. I can tell you the stuff that comes in there, if you don't question it and you, fall, and you keep letting it through, you will see deep patterns of problem solving that are truly extraordinary. And when you're under more stress, it's even more powerful. So the pattern again is, is put the questions into your mind before you go to bed. As soon as you get up, start powering away at either writing it. If some people like to handwrite it. Some people like to type it. Just get all of this genius onto paper. Don't even question it. And then get on with your day. But do not fill it with all of, the, all of the useless randomness that comes in your morning. A few questions for you to ponder. Again, for, the, for all students out there, and I would argue this still applies to any business. The first is, do you understand why you want to be in this business? Understand your why. If you understand your why, you find your how. What does it take to be successful in this business and in your role? How specific can you be in answering that question? How do you acquire skills that will enable your success? Do you know what the actions are out of this meeting? The next one, do you know how to practice or refine those skills? Number five is a massive one. And this for all of those that are already into their careers. Do you know what the key determinant is to increase your next five year, 10, five to 10 year NPV? Where is your 10 X? And what that means is if you double the inputs that you can 10 times your outputs, this changes through your career and you need to constantly be asking this question because you have to reorient your resources, which is time and energy and financial resources. Number six is what resources do you need to accomplish these goals? If you're an intellectual property asset, you need to be investing real time and real money and real effort as early as you possibly can in your career. The exponential growth chart tells you for anybody even vaguely mathematical, the more you're up front, in your efforts, the faster that curve goes steep. So you need to spend real time and real money on this. I had the great fortune of spending some time with Eddie Lampett in 2005 and 2006 at two, two retreats at Zip Brothers Investments. And I asked Eddie, how did you manage to be, to be such an accomplished investor? He compounded at 30% for 20 years. 
and he did it early in his career. And he said to me, he spent 50% of his time training, 5-0, for 10 years studying the best investments in history. We spent the next 10 years after that doing the exact same thing to about 20, 25% of our time. Are you being passive or active in acquiring these skills? Nothing worthy of, 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 of life comes easily. And then finally, what exactly is your plan for developing yourself and can you articulate your immediate and intermediate and long-term goals? Um, any questions on this before I move on? Yeah, we got two questions. The first one is from Leo. He's asking about the library practice. Maybe okay. Leo can unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, hey, hey, Yen. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask about practice. How do you know what to practice and how do you get feedback if you don't have access to a professional who's really good at what they do? Uh, so uh, the, the, the practice part is, as by the way, all of this can be self-generated, but it's even better when you do it in learning groups. So practice depends on the stage of your career, what to practice and how to practice. And this is where um, investing is a very strange profession. It's a full contact sport where most people don't train and there are no real coaches. I find that odd. Yeah, I find this is a world, this is a world scale, full contact blood sport. And, uh, you know, I, I used to be a full contact martial artist. I can't even imagine going into a ring not fully prepared. And, I, and also, I struggle with how do you improve without others being able to help dissect your game and help you analyze and improve. And so you need to equip your, yourself in different ways to either do it for yourself or bring others into your process. So if you're early on in your career, you need technical skills. Technical skills are super easy to refine. If you don't know how to model at a very advanced level, you can get a coach for that. That, that's finite. These are zero ones. It's the deliberate practice on the on the fine arts that are much harder, which is one of the questions earlier on, di on dissecting the actual feedback. But the most important part I would start with, Leo, and I'm sorry, I don't know which stage you are in, in your career, but it's like there are various hard skills that are foundational elements of any career path. Those are all commodity, by the way, and they're just tickets to play, not at all differentiators, but you need to be world class and world class quickly because you don't get to the good stuff until you acquire those skills. And frankly, all of those can be done very, very quickly. Um, guys, again, if you could just uh, mute, that would be great. Um, let me move on uh, to the next one, KY, and we'll come back to the other one. Sure. Um, this is flow state. Sorry, guys, we're, we're getting closer to the end of this. We've got a broader Q&A. Flow state is absolutely crazy. You've all experienced it. The question is, can you recreate it regularly and at will? And this is what lets you tap into your creative genius. There is a pattern, and again, it's within your control. The problem is it literally only lasts for three hours a day, max. Your brain doesn't have enough brain sugar to do any more than this. The fortunate part is this is literally all you need. The bottom left corner uh, chart here is a concept called eustress, E-U stress. The x-axis is stress, the y-axis is performance. To perform at the highest levels in anything you do requires an element of stress. But the question is how much of it and can you balance it? If it's too little and you're well within your zone, nothing happens. You're performing below your capability. If it's well beyond it, you can't handle it and eventually you'll break. It's finding that balance and that toggle. And again, you and your organization needs to learn how to control it. On the right side, effectively, what it's showing you is skill versus the level of the challenge. Flow state is the, exactly the same point I, I made on struggle before. It literally sits just outside of your existing capability. That's why certain types of puzzles and games find so enthralling. Video game programmers are masterful at layering this because it's incredibly fun when it's just a little bit too hard, but it's, if it's too easy, it's boring. And if it's way too hard, you get super anxious. There is a fine line in there and that is flow state. And my God, does that does the dopamine flow when that happens? Decision making. This is the key area for our R and D. If you want to understand how people think and act, you need to understand their mental model of the world. Absolutely critical. Frameworks for us is the critical part of refining great judgment on literally anything. Good judgment is a function of mental models or frameworks. It's iterative within a finite set of variables. You iterate towards refined judgment, but you need to develop and refine these frameworks. If it constantly changes, 
Sorry, everyone, just, just mute would be great. Um, okay, wait, can you mute the everyone, please? Oh, thank you. Um, um, Eighty percent of decisions, frankly, are generic. And if this is done right, you use your energy resources on the most important stuff. And again, the brain, that is, this is the way the actual brain functions. It, it's a finite amount of resource. Frameworks remove the things that are decisions that are effectively already made. And as leaders, you shouldn't be making those decisions. It saves a tremendous amount of time and energy that lets you use that energy on critical factors. Mental models is what we use to actually see opportunity and act with more conviction quickly. This is how our team uses rapid acceleration of knowledge in investing. We do it for styles of investing. We do it for decision making. We do it for research process. We do it for hiring. We do it for meeting structures. The whole point of it is excellence requires constant refinement of a process that can be scaled. And judgment is a process. The variables constantly change, but you need to probabilistically be able to develop the mental models uh, in order to make and refine great judgment. Next one is heroes on decision making. This is a class unto itself. Um, the only points I want to make to you here is if you want to become something special quickly in your life, you need to put yourself in a position to be accountable for your decisions as early as possible. To learn rapidly, you have to own your outcomes. Everybody I've ever studied that's been incredibly successful in their life, this is absolutely true. You will eventually become the product of your decisions. The best book that I've read that sums up decision science is this book, uh, Decisive by the Heath brothers. This is uh, two professors, uh, one from Stanford, one from Harvard. Uh, very proud parents, I'm sure. All right, let's talk about upgrading your OS. The first one, there are three I'm gonna share with you, is active speed and critical reading. This one is an absolute no-brainer. We read a tremendous amount in investing. Um, it's a massive advantage if you know how to read well, actively. Um, it takes literally eight hours to upgrade your life forever. And if you read between three, four, or five times faster than your peers, this is a game of information advantage and knowledge. Please find a way, do this. It's one day on a weekend that will change your life forever. If anyone finds a great source in North America, unfortunately, I learned this almost 30 years ago. Um, I don't have a great source for this, but I would love to share that uh, with, with everyone if you do. The next one is upgrading your memory. It comes in two forms. The first is to connect dots, you need to create dots. And that is mind maps. This is a beautiful version here on the up left. Your mind works, um, your mind does not like linear, is, isn't linear, it's contextual and it loves pictures. The mind learns with connecting pictures. It doesn't deal well with the abstract. And so go onto Google, it'll literally take you 20 minutes to understand mind maps. I had went through law school uh, in, in, in Melbourne, Australia, and I had to read over 600 cases over, over a series of years. It lets you distill days, weeks, or months of lessons into one page. And this is how your mind actually recalls. Don't try to use the linear fashion of straight down or whatever just because paper is designed that way. This is literally how your brain works and how it memorizes. So to connect dots, you need to create dots. The second part is you can't really solve what you can't remember. And this, this is the one, these, this part's honestly, I don't understand why many of the best teaching institutions in the world just don't teach this. It is so powerful and so easy. These are techniques that have been around for centuries. I would recommend, and, and frankly, there's nothing unique to Harry Lorraine's technology. It's the same technology that's been around since the Greeks. There are three or four formats that just require sheer discipline. But if you wanna have insane memory recall for numbers and facts, there is a technique that can be decoded. This is not a 20 minute exercise. This one requires real discipline, but it changes the game. Next on to uh, contrast and comparative learning and to teach you a little bit about the physics of how your eyes actually work. So frankly, you're not seeing me right now. It's too much input for your eyes and your, your conscious brain to handle. What it does is it distills down this massive analog signal and breaks it down into essential parts and backfills it. This is exactly the way the analytic minds to, uh, does it too. The world is far too complex with far too many inputs in order for you to be able to pick off every single pixelation. So contrast learning here. So the, the left side is David, the right side is COVID David, and you wouldn't be able to see the texture of the obliques of David 
without the contrast because actually seeing him you can't see it because all of the pixelation that's coming into your brain is getting distilled down into key elements and the brain just fills in what it remembers so by being able to see the contrast of the right and the left and i for, for those of you in, in the room, I, I hope that you haven't become the COVID David. I can assure you I haven't. But um, it allows you to go and say, oh, my goodness. Okay, you can see the detail in his ribs and his obliques versus the, the COVID David. The second part in here, sorry, sorry, excuse me, one more part in here. From the analytical pers perspective, we call this type 1 and type 2 uh, analysis. Type 1 is longitudinal. It's the same company, same structure, same thing against itself. You have no idea if it's good or bad. You just know if it's better or worse. There's no absolutism. It's relative to itself. Contrast learning is type two, where you're comparing stuff. Now you can start seeing strengths and weaknesses in, on a comparative basis. Segmentation on the right side here is, is again, deconstruction. To break down a, a complex problem, to solve a complex problem, requires you to break it. You need to break it down and then reassemble it. Dummy down a complex problem into simple blocks. And so this is David's right hand. By the way, this is marble. I mean, extraordinary detail, incredibly beautiful, but you would never see it when you see the picture on the left-hand side, there's too many inputs. So to break down a complex problem requires you to break it down into a series of problems. Last part here is associative learning. Abstract learning is incredibly difficult. What that means is the first time you learn a language, your brain has no framework to base that learning from. First time requires an insane amount of glucose to get through it. We learn a lot faster when it's linked to prior experiences or knowledge. This is the latter works, lattice works of your brain. We learn in links and analogies. So again, Buffett's gonna talk about the circle of competence. Circle of competence is based upon what you know and knowing what you don't know. But the other part of it is when you have a circle of competence, you can build around it. It starts by being knowledgeable and competent. And many of the greats that I know aren't universally good at everything. They're actually incredibly good at one very important thing, and they build from there. So the part for us is to take some sporting analogies. It's a lot easier to learn golf when you know how to play tennis than it is when you do it for the first time. There's elements to balance, coordination, stroke motion. If you learn a language for the first time, it's extraordinarily painful because to the brain, it's completely abstract. The second time, it's easier. The third, it's better. The fourth time's incredibly fast because there is a structure to the way that you break down the problem. For us, one of the areas that we love so is software. The first software business that we broke down was very painful, even though it fitted a lot of the frameworks that we love. The third, fourth, and fifth ones were better. The sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth ones are so much quicker because we know exactly where to look and we have a repository in our memories of what good and bad looks like. So cross-disciplinary links helps, but actually deepen it does, uh, it, it makes it even quicker. And just as a quick aside, this is literally the biology of how your brain works. So this is myelin on the bottom down here. These are the sheets that go around your nerve fibers. And the whole point of this is that it super accelerates things you already know. This is how biologically you're set up. The, the, the human body is designed. If you have patterns of recognition or patterns that get constantly used, it goes super fast. If it needs to be wired for the first time, it's super slow. Um, I'm into the last couple of slides here and then we'll go to Q&A. EQ, very, very big part of this. That's emotional question. Almost everybody in this room is either a 4.0 or some version thereof. Um, mastery of your emotions is far more important than the technical skills. And first part here, I really want to stress to you, and for those entering this business, especially the reformed perfectionists, this is the part that nothing can prepare you for. You will fail more in this business in the first year than your entire life to date, and it will be measurable. And if you don't know how to overcome that, you probably shouldn't come. You need a decent IQ to play this game. Buffett's talked a lot about that, but you need a very strong EQ to survive it, yet alone play this well. His Holiness the Dalai Lama here on the left-hand side has taught me, and I've learned a lot of this through Buddhism and, and through, um, uh, again, on, 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 and from Daniel Goleman next to him, who's the author of Emotional Intelligence. There's a whole genre which he has written with His Holiness, which I think are extraordinarily applicable to investing. The part here is absolutely, you've got to know who you are. 
and investing is in many ways a spiritual game. And I, and I don't mean that by hiding under your desk and praying to God when you have a crisis like what we're facing. It's a deep test of conviction under certain periods of time, and it will find dark places in your analysis that no other way can do it. Stress reveals. And so you need to find an investment style that matches your skills, your talent, and your temperament. For those who aren't focused on investing, I would argue that for any profession, markets are a really expensive place to discover who you are. But before we leave this, I want you to, I want you to know, you've got to respect your emotions. They will reveal who you are under stress and emotions will overwhelm your intellect. It's a, it's a biological hack. It's actually designed that way. Your emotions are actually very intelligent at times, and you need to know how to handle them, read them, overcome them if required. There are a lot of unnatural actions in investing where risk is a function of price, and when people are panicking, you need to overcome that reptilian response. If you don't know how to manage your emotions, there is a saying in Wall Street, this is the reason why many of the four O's work for the three O's. The difference between just being smart and being commercial and being able to lead is can you actually lead yourself and handle your emotions? Last slide here is on mentors and peers. KY rightfully asked me to close with this. This is a, is a critical success factor in every successful person I've ever studied. Mentors will help you navigate the path. They'll open your eyes, they'll open doors, they'll help you avoid landmines. Peers, they'll elevate your standards and help you redefine the possible. This is many of the reasons why you're coming to, this, to Columbia or the various schools that you've gone to, is to upgrade your peer group and you'll do everything in your power to be worthy to stay with them and to grow together. So a few short tips here. One is you have to earn the right to become a mentee. There are plenty of mentees around you, mentors around you. They don't have to be huge stretches. They can be parents of friends. They can be bosses. They're all around you. It's people who've gone through life around you. But you have to earn the right to become a mentee. And that means being a good person and, and uh, paying it forward. It's a very unusual relationship, mentor-mentee. It's the only relationship that isn't truly bi-directional. It's actually we're aligned in the, same, in the same direction. And what that means is you want to, we, a mentor wants a mentee just to pay it forward, amplify their goodwill into this world. A few other tips in here. Um, it is strategic giving and taking, and you need to be smart about this and be extremely uh, dependable. So Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, is quite insightful on this. Act on the advice given. There's nothing harder for a mentor who, who's already short of time than to keep repeating themselves with a mentee. And then invest in long-term relationships. Dale Carnegie's book, which was written in 1936, has universal wisdom on how to win friends and influence people. There is just relational um, wisdom in there. Uh, finally, here's my wish for you. You find your why, you work out your how, you choose a game wisely that you find fulfilling. Don't just choose success, seek fulfillment. Learn to lead yourself and then others. Surround yourself with peers you admire and respect. Acquire mentors who show you the path or assist you. And then learn like crazy, work like crazy, and win like crazy. I hope you embrace and enjoy the struggle that is the journey of excellence. And with closing, um, please just shoot me an email. This is not my personal email, but we'd love to form a learning community and at least find a way to reach out to you if there's anything incremental that, that uh, could benefit this community. Just drop me a line at this email and we'll start propagating a list. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to broader questions and, and thank you very much for your time. KYO to you. Thank you, Yen. So this is great sharing and we have our, a couple of questions accumulated already. The first question is from Harsha. Harsha, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, Yen. Uh, thanks so much. I had a question on the power of focus. How do you decide what to focus on and prioritize, especially in a world of distraction? And this is like either in the micro, like on the day-to-day -day, or even over like larger arcs of time. Um, Harsha, on the bottom left side here is the answer to it. Um, and this is a matrix you probably should just keep on your desk. Um, and also, if you don't feel like you know what matters, don't stop. Because it probably tells you you, don't, you haven't found it yet. So the construct here is, in the, in, when you, and, and the construct of most problem sets is the scientific method which is the construction of, have you architected the question right, and then have you formulated a thesis to answer it, and is the thesis solid or not? And this is the construct of what comes under 
the archetype of the question. So is it important or unimportant in answering the question? And then henceforth, is it knowable or unknowable? Thank you, Are Yan. You, yeah, please. Go, no, go on, please. No, just please go on. I was going to introduce another question. Yep, go, right. let's go, yep. Okay, so next question is from Laurent. Laurent is actually a learning machine himself as well. As well. I worked with him before on some projects. Laurent, please. Laura, are you here? Okay, we could jump to another person first. Jean Phillips, please. Yeah, I thank you again, Yen. Uh, so I was wondering, what do you think are the best habits and routines of great investors? And then in the investment world, uh, what is in your opinion the 20% that drive, uh, drives the 80%, the, the key drivers? Thanks. Great, thanks JP. Uh, habits and routines. So um, one of them is, uh, and I would offer this as a broad advice for, for all the students. Um, early in your career, you should say yes to most things. Late in your career, you should say no to most things. And um, I think one of the most powerful habits of great investors and great leaders in general is offensive control of their schedules. Uh, you have to be in control. If you aren't in control, you're always reacting. And frankly, other people are dictating to you what's important. So you've got to be an offense. Um, I think Buffett's control of his schedule is masterful. There's nothing more soul destroying than seeing a schedule that's absolutely jam full of useless meetings. Uh, we're in a business where time really matters. Time is our scarcest resource. Um, and if you aren't fully control and in offense of your time, you're not going to succeed, period. And so for me, I would argue um, uh, the habit that I've studied um, the habits that I that I've you know and actually I think you're saying one more thing in there um, JP which is we're having our time hearing you uh, Jan I don't know if it's oh, just sorry. me uh, can you can you hear me now uh, KY can we can you hear me I think now is good could okay, you sorry. try your sentences okay sorry about that um, the point on habits is to actually find um, habits that work from from many other people and um, and pull parts of it and, and make them you, your own. And like you have to formulate and steal or borrow things that you'd like from others uh, that you can use for yourself. And so um, I, I would also say uh, the other routines, it depends on what your strike zone is. And for me, the optimal zone is mornings. And so from eight till you know one or two in the afternoon is absolutely highest flow zone. And I have to protect it at all costs. So trying not to have meetings, have full control of your email. There's a lot of useless crap with people that people think is important and creates productivity, which isn't at all. Um, the next thing here in the 20 that drives the 80, the 20 that drives the 80 is the commodity stuff, quite frankly. And it's just like, that's just simple things and understanding, like game selection is the most important of that, I would argue, is knowing where to hunt, why there's pockets of structural inefficiency that you can exploit, um, that, you think, that you think fits your emotions, and over time is a lot of alpha to be mined. Um, the next part of that is uh, the, the, the same building blocks. I find excellence is not, Roger Federer doesn't hit a forehand any differently than anyone else. He hits it perfectly. And I think that's the difference is like, you have a few select skills that absolutely matter. The way we do primary research, there's nothing different in the way that we do primary research. We just do it really rigorously. There's nothing different in the way that we model. We just do it incredibly rigorously and we know the limits of it. And so uh, I would say the 20 that drives the 80 is very commodity. The twenty that the, the remaining twenty that takes you to world world class is extreme discipline and execution of the same things. Quite frankly, but again, focused on. Uh, I think game selection is the highest part of that. Um, Ky, should we go to the next question? Yes, Laurent, please. Uh, hi, Ian. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I was curious about journal uh, journaling. Can you share some best practice that you do? and uh, especially how you can trans translate your journaling into your uh, develop your own mental models. And also, um, uh, second question, um, you know, um, I was curious about um, kind of portfolio management. Can you share a little bit about how do you manage portfolio on a high level? And you don't have to comment on the current environment. Uh, like that. Thank you so much. Well, massive questions. Thank you, Laura. I'll, uh, I'll hit the first one on journaling um, and developing mental models. Um, Journaling, so I, I've done this in many other ways for, for the past 15, almost 20 years. Uh, and you, you should do whatever is useful for you. But the way that I specifically do it is, is I, I type into Evernote. And the reason why I type it into Evernote is it's searchable and, it, and it's digital. 
I used to do it in leather bound diaries. And if the problem is you can't search for different patterns or words in there. And what you're trying to do over journaling is not just um, longitudinal or, or based on, on chronology, you're actually looking for patterns. And so um, there, it's helpful to go back and go, okay, you know what, the world was going to hell in the second week of, of March, what were you thinking, what were you doing? Could you explain all your decisions? That's very helpful. But actually being able to also thread it together where, okay, how does that also relate to the fourth quarter in 2018 or the first quarter in 2016? Are there patterns in there? That's more interesting. And so what I found, and also you have to make it very easy. So wherever you are in the world, you can do it. I found uh, by doing it into Evernote, I can even do voice logs if I have to quickly into my phone, it gets sent into that. I type it on my laptop, it's, it's, it's in there. And there's one central repository. And more importantly, I can search it by word, word, um, word search it. Mental models is a vastly different exercise and a very, very involved process because that requires a sledgehammer um, to, to go back to this is it requires it to be focused on very, very specific skills or, or genres and just keep pounding away at that controlled leap. So for example, again, if you wanna use a sporting analogy, if you wanna break down the game of tennis, you have to know how to hit a whole series of different styles of forehands perfectly, right? And for me in this, uh, what we do for developing mental models, this is the class we taught at both Harvard and Columbia, is, uh, and we've done 500 of these, it's absolutely excruciatingly difficult work, is we've broken down the genres of investing to the ones that we think are the highest performing, and we've just kept going deeper, 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 and then taken small parts of it and gone even deeper on those. The important part of mental models is to make the implicit explicit, because under extreme stress, I'm not sure if they're on this call, I have friends who are Navy SEALs, under extreme stress, your training comes through, right? And if you guess, under extreme stress, you're dead. And so the difference between being able to perform under stress, which I would argue is why, you, is the thing that differentiates those who should and should not be in this industry, it's the most stressful moments where you discover, do you really know what you're doing or not? Um, and the mental models that we use is we break it down by both functional skill set as well as genre of investing and then sub-genres within it to try to make it more explicit. And it is still difficult, by the way, despite that knowledge. Um, that's part of the, the, the beauty of this. I think I'll have to save the PM comment for, for, for a separate day. That's, an, that's almost a topic unto itself um, and, uh, and the, in the current environment. Um, listen, I'll just touch on that very briefly and then and we've got you know, 20 or so minutes. We'll expand it back onto, onto questions and answers. We're clearly in a very challenged uh, state right now globally and we're seeing a huge fight back from uh, governments globally. Uh, I think they've managed to avoid the global depression scenario. Uh, for now, uh, a global uh, deflationary spiral could be very, very tricky. And I think, again, fiscal and monetary policy at the levels that the governments have done globally have indicated there is unlimited amounts of firepower to backstop it. COVID-19 is going to be with us for at least two years. Um, even with a vaccine arriving quickly, it's not going to be manufactured globally in enough scale to, to eliminate this for everyone. Uh, the death rate is likely lower than is feared. Um, therapeutics are arriving, which will help us uh, live with social distancing and, and, and take the tops off uh, fatality rates in hospitals. But we'll be coexisting with this for a while. And so, um, you know, we will adapt, we will deal with this. Those of you who are dialing in from Hong Kong or China or Singapore know that, that life works uh, even despite this. It's just you have to adapt. Uh, and I, and I, fully, I fully believe we, we, will, we will do so. But, you know, the next couple of months or even years and quarters, they're still going to be challenging. We're not through this yet. Um, but anyway, let me let me shift gears, uh, KY, to another question on learning. Yeah. And the next is Adrian. Though. It's about broad and depth. Adrian, please unmute yourself. Hi, Ian. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so something that I often struggle with uh, is what to prioritize uh, when, when learning. So that uh, scope versus that question. So if you wanted to start and be the leader of a very successful organization, would you say it's more important to be uh, the best in the world in one very specific subject, such as you know, uh, finance or software development, or would you say it's more important to uh, have a broad range of skills, even though uh, you're just uh, you know, well-versed, good enough at them? Thank you. Um, this is a great question and a hard one for uh, for obviously everybody to to grapple with. And prioritization, um, if you're going to be a leader, you're an allocator of time and resources. So human assets, physical assets, financial assets. That is the definition of leadership. 
and, and leadership starts with leading yourself. And so um, what it comes down to is, do you know what's important? And do you know what moves the ball forward on what's important? And if you don't, keep asking questions for people that do. And this is also where, uh, Adrian, that you know, having mentors really helps because that, that equation constantly changes in your career. At the start of your career, you have to be proficient. There are certain skills that are absolutely necessary, but not sufficient conditions to success. If you're gonna start in this business and you don't know how to model, you don't know accounting, you better learn really fast, right? And so, but to answer your question on depth versus breadth, all mastery comes from depth, but all, th this is a very complex world that requires a, you know, a whole f broad framing of disciplines in order to gain insight. We're actually in the insight business, insight and then action business, but um, you need to generate insights. And so how do you see the world in a way that's different from the rest of the world? And that's cross-disciplinary. It's learning from a whole bunch of different things. But ultimately, if you want to outcompete the, 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 the military thing is called Schwerpunkt. And the, the whole term of Schwerpunkt means you bring overwhelming force to the moment and the point that matters. And that requires deep understanding of each of the elements. Again, if you're going to focus in, if you're coming into finance, you need some requisite skills at a good enough level. You're not going to be the best in the world investor if you're just a master modeler but then you're gonna have to pick your spots on what you're really good at because you're competing with the entire world. And so to answer your question, it's kind of both. And if you can't work it out, keep asking the mentors that are around you to help guide you a little bit on it. But you'll need to develop skills, base level skills that are wide to a requisite level of, of, of good enough. And then you're gonna have to pick some areas where you're gonna have to go deep. If you wanna compete against the world, you have to outcompete it and you're not gonna do that playing broad. The one other question you didn't ask is strengths and weaknesses in there. Ultimately, excellence always comes on the basis of, of strength. You need to bring up your, your weaknesses or buttress them with people around you to a minimum standard. And then you need to go medieval on what you are really good at. Let's go to the next question, KY. Yeah. To your chair on this, I just wanted to point out that this is actually a very interesting combination between Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett because Charlie Munger is known for broad and then Warren Buffett is known for very deep. So the next question would be from Jacqueline. Please unmute yourself. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Hey, thanks, Yan. Uh, so my question is about regarding the uh, struggling versus suffering. In theory, they're differentiated by with or without meaning. And then how do we really determine that what we're striving for at a particular moment is truly meaningful for our lives or not? Especially, say for example, in the long run, if we zoom out, um, it's something that you're chasing in a particular moment might not be definitely um, practical or um, beneficial for your life in the long run, but just because you've put in so many, so much effort already. So um, at that particular moment, it fulfills you if you can get it done emotionally. Um, and so how do you determine that if something you're chasing for the particular moment are truly meaningful or not, so that to determine is something that worth chasing uh, so as to determine that um, it's struggle versus suffering? Uh, this is a very complex question and obviously beyond investing. Um, and the, the, the only point that I'd give you here is uh, for those of you who have physically labored, um, like hardcore physically labored, I'm a double immigrant. There's tons of immigrants on this, on this call. Uh, there's tons of people who've come from, from you know, true blue collar black backgrounds to fight into, into finance and other professional services. And the only part that I would put in here, this is all about, um, about framing. And, um, you know, investment banks have, have changed their stance on this, but um, investment banks and consultant firms, we used to work three, four hundred hour months. You know, it's like we used to work like crazy. And um, the question is, does it break you or does it make you stronger? And it's really a function of relative to what and how do you frame it? And so here's the framing I give for you, and I can't answer your specific situation because you have to give it and dimensionalize it yourself. Um, I would argue that all of our pain tolerance is no different than Warren Buffett's, zero difference. It just depends on what's at stake. So if I told you to run into a burning building for a dollar, you wouldn't do it. Wouldn't be worth the pain. A million dollars, some of you may run into it. If it's your children, you're gonna run into the building. And so without even thinking. And so the, the ability to struggle or to suffer, it's just a question of for what is at stake. If you were in this business just for the money, you're not gonna last because the emotional suffering that you, you won't be able to handle the damage that comes. 
although there are obviously parts of the industry you can hide within but you will judge it and frankly this is again your subconscious versus your conscious you will know over time it's a question of how fast can you work it out but it's it's all a question of what's at stake and how important is it to you and if you've done backbreaking work and all you're doing there is crunching spreadsheets trust me it doesn't feel that bad next question Rajin. please unmute yourself yeah hi can you hear me yes we can thanks Rajin. yeah so my question is like how to choose a mentor region is you know like mentor uh, uh importance in our life is very important and there are so many people you know like uh, they have different uh, intent and uh, sometimes i feel very confused like he's the right mentor or he has different intentions um so i wouldn't isolate it down to one mentor and the other part here is um listen it's a real privilege to have mentors it's a privilege to be able to share with you guys today. And I thank you all for your time on this. Um, I, I view my life as being extraordinarily lucky that I've had the kindness of strangers, friends, uh, and others to, to help me on my way. And um, Rajan, you know, if, if there are people out there that are looking out for you, that can share wisdom with you, you still have to selectively work out what makes sense for you. And if you're questioning their motives, I can already tell you that's the wrong mentor. And if you're questioning their wisdom, find another mentor. So I, you know, you don't don't focus all your bets on one. Is probably the advice I would have there, and listen to your gut a little bit. But you also have to be smart about contextualizing their advice. Okay, well, should we go to the next? Rainbow, please. Hi, Yan. Thank you very much for your. Oops. Sorry. That's okay. Hi, Rainbow. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your amazing session. It's been yeah, really uh, great to learn from you on how to learn. Um, I have a question regarding journaling. Uh, I think you know, it's great that you talk about self-reflection through journaling, um, but how else would you recommend us to accelerate the feedback loop so that we can learn from mistakes quickly? Um. Well, feedback loops is also a function of how much you do. So if you do, you know, one trade every five years, it's going to be very difficult for you to get feedback loops. Um, so you'll have to find ways to synthetically test decision making. Um, and that also helps by having either paper portfolios or uh, discussions where you're doing, um, you know, deep analytics with different people. But you need to have uh, a feedback loop requires an action and, 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 and an output. And so the more times, the more reps you can put into that, the better. Um, actually, if you can mute people again, KY would be great. Um, it, the, it, it's adding more reps and making sure there's sufficient uh, feedback loops. So um, it's anything that can add reps, uh, Rainbow, that will, that will accelerate your learning curve. Um, and also the other parts of this is there are other ways to break down the game within the game. Uh, it shouldn't be all into one mega decision. There should be sub parts. Uh, of the decisions or your actions where you can tune to work out if it does it. So I'll give you again a small example of this on primary research. You can tune how you uh, engage with, um, with primary sources and you know, do three different formats of emails or voice uh, scripts and see what the take rate is. That's a feedback loop. You can, um, it's not just necessarily is the stock up or down, there's a whole lot of drivers in the stock is up or down. Can you analyze so that your earnings number or your sales number or your gross margin number, is that accurate or not? Can you tune that part of the game irrespective of the stock? That's a feedback loop. Um, so those are, are a few ways for you to break down the game a little bit. KY, over to you. Yep, uh, Melody, please. Um, hello, hello, Yan. Thank you so much for sharing, and it is a very great session. And you talked a lot about uh, these construct different skills, and sometimes when you are mastering the skill, you could be stuck in a plateau. So, how can someone like like me, very early in my career, tell the difference between I'm stuck in the plateau, and as long as I put enough time, I will reach something, versus that's the limit of my skill, and maybe I should put consider a different career path. Well, wow, that is a great question. Um, 
Yeah, that, that is a very, very good question um, and a really, really tough one to answer. So the, the plateaus, I can tell you from almost everybody, um, there are always ways to advance it. Um, so the, 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 the question I've had to, I'll break it down into two forms. I've played tennis all my life. I'm not beating Roger Federer. It's that simple. No matter what I do to advance my plateaus, I'm not beating him, so I'm not going to be world class. That is part of game selection. You should know the games that you're built to play and that you have a shot at being world class at. It's that simple. Can you ever see yourself? Do you have the emotional makeup to be a decision maker under extraordinary stress, right? This game is not for everyone. And or for that matter, it depends on which role you want to play. There's plenty of great roles within this, or this industry that you can play extremely well, be very well compensated, learn like crazy, and have a really fun life. Just, you know, this comes back to a little bit of know thyself. In terms of skill advancement and plateauing, um, you don't actually have to be the best to play extremely well. It's a very arrogant statement to say that only the best should play. Um, and so the, the point on plateauing and skill development is no matter what skill, I don't care who's, who you are, whoever's on this call, how many years you've been in this industry, there are skills across the board that we can advance. And we have to be selective again as leaders, we're allocating time and resources. Where is the skill set that you want to advance to another level? You know, even if you're a therapist or a teacher, like you can become next level and be even more effective in what you do by advancing very specific elements of your skill set to increase output and, and results. So I think they're two very separate questions, Melody. I think the plateaus, you can control them. The, un, the controlled leaps means where do you focus your attention to refine it? The, the other part I think you're also talking about is game selection, where it's really know yourself on what you can become world-class at, or at least seek to become sufficiently proficient that you live a very fulfilling life. Okay, why next question? Kefi, please. Okay, sure. Thanks very much, Yen. And I kind of do agree that it's extremely useful to use associate learning techniques, um, specifically in investment. And when we try to learn a new industrial segment, we kind of recall the patterns of um, familiar industries we have learned before. But uh, we are also very easily to fall into some oversimplification question and may miss um, important things. So, so I want, just want to know what's your opinion on this problem and do you have any suggestions to avoid this kind of pitfall? Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful question, Kathy. Thank you. Um, it's called disconfirming evidence is the approach there. Um, so you've, you've hit on a wonderful topic and this is the danger of frameworks is, is uh, you know, if, um, if you've got a hammer and a nail and that's, uh, and, and that's the only tools that you, you use, everything starts looking like a hammer and a nail or at least every problem you're solving is trying to use the same tool. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, the simple way to do it, uh, the most important way to do it, and frankly to also make sure that you do see is, um, is disconfirming evidence. And what I mean by that is when it refutes your thesis, you need to amplify it in a very different way and do it consistently. The way that we do it internally, we literally highlight disconfirming evidence in a different color. So that when we write up call reports, when we write up primary research, we write up our thinking, we're not looking for things to confirm, we're looking for things to disconfirm. Um, you will kid yourself constantly with this approach. Uh, what frameworks do is it eliminates the, the addressable universe or addressable situations or the decisions into a very finite decision set that helps it extremely quickly. Then you need to start dissecting and looking at confirming and disconfirming evidence, but you focus much more heavily on the disconfirming evidence. And so I think your question is excellent uh, and a really, really important part of this. The brain works in heuristics. Again, it's shortcuts because it's trying to save energy. And that's how you stump people. Fantastics on the shorts, by the way, is, is their bluffs um, that people are assuming, but actually the fact patterns don't, don't, uh, don't represent it. And so going deep and making sure that you highlight disconfirming evidence is the way I would strongly recommend it. KY to you. Dabi, you're next. Hi, Ian. This is uh, Dabi, or you can call me Sherry. So thanks so much for all the great advice and valuable reading list you've shared. And I totally agree on the importance of learning from others, but I think it's also important for us to find out what actually works for us. So how would you suggest us determine if others best practices are suitable for us and if not how should we develop our own ones like in our own authentic ways thank you um Jabi, there's a lot of lot of questions in there and what works for us is this is this just requires a lot of introspection and there is by the way you, you're also touching on one other very important point there 
there are many ways, many paths to life. There is no one way. And I can't stress this enough to all of you. There is lots of industries, lots of roles, lots of paths. There is many, many ways to living an incredibly fulfilling life and making your contribution and being so happy and thrilled about your advancement and what you're being challenged at. Um, so the first point I want to make that is that one, Javi, is there are just lots and lots and lots of different paths to life. There is no one. The second then is you have to have the strength and you actually have to invest in knowing yourself, right? The same job, the same role for two different people is misery or bliss. And so deeply investing and going introspective is really, really important. And I think, you know, knowing yourself is probably the most, the first and most important part of investing or any career, I would argue, is you're trying to suit your genius with the role and this world. You're trying to find um, product fit with the need in this world. And so, you know, how do you know that people's ways work for you or don't? You should sit down, think it through, talk it through, journal it, whatever it is, and adapt it. But the whole point of, and of today as well is just like, don't take anything I've said as grace. This is all a work in process, right? It's my best efforts of, of 35 years of, of learning style. It's like, I hope to improve it. The questions that have been asked today have already improved me. I'm sure I'll be getting some things from, from you all in, in the way that you think that's going to advance and question the way that I think. And there's definitively a lot of different things that don't work for me. And part of this is I had to work it out. I made mistakes. I learned from it. I kept moving forward. So I'll give you a small example for this. We are not hyper traders. It doesn't work to my advantage. It doesn't work to my temperament. It throws me completely off. And so a lot of this is introspection. Uh, KY, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, the final question will be from Jamie. Hello, Ian. Hello, KY. This is Jamie. Um, first, thank you so much for the time and presentation. My question is about segmentation that you mentioned earlier. Could you, could you give us an example how you successfully break down a topic um, without getting too much into the weeds that's probably not the most important? Um, seg segmentation is just breaking down complex problems into sub problems. So just as a small example for this, like it, we're, we're aerospace investors right now and it's incredibly complex what's going on in aerospace clearly, right? Given COVID-19, um, the whole sector on leisure has been, been absolutely hammered and you could just step back and go, my God, that's unanalyzable. So the question on segmentation is you've got to break down the problem into areas that you can actually understand. And so when we, what, we, what that means for us to break that down a little bit more is like uh, aerospace is not, is not just one thing. Aerospace is OEM or aftermarket. You can break it down again. OEM, sorry, aftermarket, narrow body, wide body. Right? Um, and then within narrow body, you've got to be able to work out old fleet, new fleet. And so what we, the point is, it's like in terms of working out what matters and then segmentation, segmentation means, again, breaking down a very complex problem into addressable chunks. What can you analyze that's important to an outcome that, that swings uh, a decision? So the whole point on segmentation is, is again, is, is breaking down, deconstructing a problem into its constituent parts into a finite enough area that you can work out actually matters. So segmentation also comes back down to, um, to this on the bottom left corner. You're trying to segment a problem into what is knowable and important. You're trying to break down the segmentation into that 20% that drives 80% of the results. And so segmentation applies to the analysis. It applies to the way that you break down skill development. You can't accomplish the overarching thing in one hit. It doesn't exist. Every skill, every problem is a subset of a series of questions and a series of skills. Um, with that, I want to thank KY for, for arranging this and hosting this. I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful uh, hour and a half. It's gone through very, very quickly. Um, and I, I hope that, uh, you know, please drop me an email and, and so that we can find a way to, uh, to reach out to you again in the future if this was productive. And, uh, you know, please stay safe. This too shall pass. We will, we will all emerge from this into a productive world. And uh, uh, thank you very, very much for your time. And, and you know, good luck to you all. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Yen. You're the man. You're the man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you.